didn't show it to you already, but maybe it'll show you now. And we are live. John Reed and Brian Summer Enterprise Month in Review Round Two. How you doing, Brian? I'm fine. I uh, I survived uh, seven out of eight weekly trips yep. to Las Vegas now. So um, yep. ask me anything you want to know. What what's what's my least favorite gate, or how uh, bad is the uh, the overpriced food is at Las Vegas? Um, actually, I'm actually I'm not going to do that. Sorry, um, but you you did overdress me again. So congratulations. It's not hard, but you did it. Nice job. <laughs> you you don't set the bar too high. No, I don't I don't set the bar too high. But I have a jacket on, so that's something. Um, oh boy oh boy greg's already firing in uh okay this is greg greg robinette he wants to learn how to exemplify ai as a service for generative innovation across a palette of text textured information pools and fountains well greg you came to the right place man you came to the right place you know i really hope we get to do the bit we talked about at the end of the show because it will it will address greg's uh you know concerns a hundred percent Yep, Greg, we're all in, just so you know. Um, <laughs> so so the Enterprise Month in Review, this is our second crack, and we're, we're, we're continuing to refine the format. It's it's a little bit of a late-night talk show format in some ways, so we, we will have a guest join us on the couch. In this case, it's Lori McCabe, and she'll be on in 20 minutes if all goes as planned. Um, and you're probably going to expect us to start out by talking about fall events, but we're not. <laughs> and the reason for that is that this show is really about uh, the uh, you know kind of telling you what we think are the most important topics that that customers care about right now. And if we just talk about events, then in my view, we're just kind of accepting a spoon fed narrative from vendors. Which, no offense to the vendors out there, because you have your talking points, but you know we're we're doing something different here. However, I'm sure Lori's going to have a lot to say on fall events. So don't worry, you're going to get your fall events fix. But uh, we start the show by looking at some of the top stories that we are tracking. And as always, your comments are central to the show. So welcome, Thomas, and welcome, Greg. I'm not going to post your lollipop comment because I don't really know where you're, if we have any lollipops today. Brian, I'm going to add your slides to the stage because your slides kind of give the peeps a little bit of a view. You even made a nice graphic for us. Thank you. Um, here's our agenda. Oh yeah. We we're trying to get Lori to participate in something a little off color on the humor side, but we don't know yet whether that's going to happen, but there'll, there'll be some humor regardless. So Brian, do you want to get started? Oh, oh, by the way, can I say one other thing, which is Brian and I don't tell each other in advance what topics we're going to pick for our top stories and underrated stories and stuff like that. So uh, it turns out we pick some of the same ones, but we don't orchestrate that. We kind of pick the things we think are important. So, Brian, with that disclaimer in mind, what what you got for us? Well, the first one that popped up here is uh, a piece that was in, I think it was Fast Company, and it was called uh, One Possible Reason Many CEOs Want Remote Workers Back in the Office Is They Want Some to Quit. And it's interesting that I've actually heard people speculate about that, uh, trying to figure out why are they making us go back? And they're thinking it's also a really cheap, underhanded way to get employees to leave so they don't even have to pay work, I mean, uh, unemployment comp. Um, anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, piece. You can find it. Um, like I said, I think it is Fast Company. I've got the article here printed out, but for some reason I can't immediately spot the the link on it here anyway you've got the title there i thought it was a fascinating quick little read because it speaks to i think a cynical reality that's out there and i think more employees ought to be hip to the fact that they're getting played by some really cheap firms or leaders and in fact if this is what your company's doing maybe you ought to leave because do you really want to work at a place that plays games like this and really tries to screw around its workers that's kind of a kind of a you know a cynical con uh, approach that some managers might take john yeah indeed um just a few quick things from the chat thomas is complaining about our agenda thomas come on man look at that agenda that <laughs> There's not even any time hey, frames on there. Um, the, the formal deal, if he doesn't like that, next he'll be telling me to drop the tie and jacket. But go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Rebecca, yeah, great minds. Well, I, I'd like to think so, but I think that's that's optimistic. Rebecca, if you're still hanging out at the end of the hour, we might have you drop in. So let's worry about that later. And Tracy, thanks for showing up and um, hang out for a little bit. Might want to ask you about your office purchase because uh, that ties into the topic. Brian, um, you have a couple more articles on this theme, I believe. Yeah. This one I thought was interesting because someone went to the trouble of quantifying what it cost an employee to spend a day working at the office. And they're looking at everything from, uh, you know, the uh, gasoline or whatever to get them down. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, to get them to back and forth to the office for their commute, the meals that they might buy or purchase, whatever, it, whether it's even at the company cafeteria or it's outside the business, and, 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 and. And this is an angle that I think has really been underreported in the whole back to the office kind of uh, movement. And if I were an employee and my management was giving me some grief, I'd ask him, well, hey, at least give me a $51 a day kind of um, stipend to work with because you factor that out over about 200 plus work days a year. You're starting to talk about some real money that's coming out of people's back pockets. And I think it's a fair thing to bring up. This article, by the way, I found that in you know, the Gannett News Service. Uh, I saw it in, in the Indianapolis Star myself, but you can probably find it online as well, folks. So. Brian, I just want to touch on that for just a minute because I think it's interesting because I follow your curations a fair amount and it seems like you, you read fairly widely still like print type stuff. Are you able to find things that you're not able to find online as easily? Well, I don't suffer from the problem of finding things stuck behind a paywall. I mean, because I pay for mm. subscriptions, if you will, I get it all. And um, yeah, and you know, pretty much... A lot of the stuff that I subscribe to is going to come to me electronically as well, or they curate a piece of it and put it on the website as a teaser or what have you. But yes, I still read old fashioned papers and magazines. And part of the reason I do that is because, um, you know, when you're stuck in a middle seat on 47D in the back of a 777, thank you, United Airlines, um, I can't really do much as far as like whip out a. Um, laptop try and scroll because i got these huge people on either side of me but i can actually pull magazines out of my briefcase and i can read them there indeed advanced travel tips from brian thomas wants to take take on a topic here wouldn't employers argue that this is priced into the salary well they could argue that but uh they'd have a revolt on their hands more importantly they could argue, uh, excuse me, the employees could argue that, well, if that was the case, then why didn't you take that out of my salary when we started working remotely during the pandemic? You know, I, th I think there has to be recognition that some people have to spend a lot of money. And in fact, what's not here is what about the money that some people pay for you know, child care or elder care because now they have to go to the office and those costs might have been avoided in the past. So th I think the number is at $51 a day. That sounds reasonable or it sounds appropriate or what I would have expected. But I think for some people, the number could be quite a bit higher. So Thomas, could it's a good question. I just think um, I think it's I think you're serving the boss taskmasters out there with that kind of a point. And I just don't think it's going to hold any great sympathy with employees. Because they're jerks. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna table that one for now. <laughs> um, I ha I have a couple of stump speeches about flexible work. We we don't have time to get into all of it today, but but one one of them is that that by depriving themselves of flexible work policies, companies lose access to a lot of talent for the reasons you described. That some of the most talented people out there are juggling life commitments that make traditional commuting impossible. Um, but the other element, uh, which is interesting, is the sort of digital nomad argument, which is that lifestyle flexibility means ha happier workers. Greg says he spent a year working from an RV while exploring the United States. It was amazing. He thinks he provided a much higher value during that time simply because of the fact that he welcomed every day of work and exploration that his life allowed. That That's shockingly enlightened compared to life in corporate <laughs> cubicles, Greg. And, and to me... I'd like to think that that kind of thing is the future of work. Unfortunately, 
we don't know that yet. But to me, that's the battlefield on which we can play this out. And, you know, probably the wrong word to use. But the point being like, I, I'd love to see companies compete based on offering that kind of flexible employment and see how far they can get. Mm-hmm. Um, Brian, so this, this is also, a- this is the same topic, right? No, this is oh the sec- separate topic. Okay. Switching to AI. Okay, okay. Point, yeah. All right, so let me hold off on that for a sec, but we will okay. we will come we will come back to AI in just a moment. Um, I wanted to also, but John, uh, haven't you heard about the power of the incredible transformative capabilities that generative AI can deliver to companies like you? It's absolutely game changing. Or maybe it is. Heard that, it know? is. It is indeed. In fact, maybe I was just reading something online about how Microsoft is going to make it possible for you to send an AI representative to your online meetings, which sounds pretty awesome. Um, and you know, so so I think one of the really interesting things about return to work, and by the way, uh, for the audience, we Brian and I usually pick our top story and our sort of under the radar story. And my under the radar story was going to be this whole return to office debate slash imperative and i think a lot of employers are are trying right now to reimpose their will so to speak and it's not going all that well as a rule as far as like rigid return to office policies there's an article it's time to end the war on remote work which is actually on us news it's a little bit of a polemic but the theme is that leaders are in a losing battle with their employees over office attendance then there's a really interesting um podcast write up on McKinsey on on this topic and um and yet I don't have it up on my screen I have other McKinsey articles but I'll find it in a sec um yeah it's called hybrid work urban ecosystems in the future of real estate but you know obviously the real attention point there, there there's two things going on right one is that there's a lot of people that are really eager to figure out what the future of the office really looks like like um, you know, I talked to a couple companies that are really openly reevaluating it and saying things like, yeah, we find that it's great to get people together for more informal things like um, team building things or even social experiences, that that tends to be what works really well, right? As opposed to bringing people together uh, and, and then having Zoom meetings all day while you're back in your cube, that seems very inefficient. The problem is, of course, that a lot of companies have huge real estate footprints that they need to rationalize. And this, this McKinsey article has some doozy quotes on this. And one of, the one, one of the quotes I really like was at the end of the article, rethinking spaces, tenants dealing with a lot of uncertainty and all this stuff. And really good line, historically, offices house the means of production, I thought that was really interesting from a white collar perspective, right? That offices used to be where we produced all of this work. I'm going to paste a link to this article in the chat. Um, So anyway, that's just a really interesting concept, right? That offices used to be where we produced work. But I'm going to make the argument that in the post-pandemic office world, that offices aren't our means of production anymore. That they should be our means of, if we're going to use them for anything, they should be means of collaboration and strategy sessions and, you know, team building kind of things, but not actually, I think we're going to do a lot better producing work in different environments than the cubicle. Anyway, it's kind of an interesting concept. That article has a bunch of cool stuff in there on, on that topic. So Christopher Carter says used to be an SAP office in Cincinnati, but they closed it. And Tracy, you actually opened an office, right? And you chose a suburban location for that. Love to hear a little more in the chat about why you did that. But Brian, we need to move on because we only have a few more minutes and we got to get to a- auto magical AI. So let me pull your s- slides back up here if I can do that successfully. Uh, so what you got there? So this one is one I don't think got anywhere near enough attention. Uh, uh, this was... Uh, Malcolm Frank actually flagged this in his newsletter, and then I went and pulled another article up that it had more meat on this issue. But Accenture is training people, 250,000 people on AI. And according to this other article, they've already trained 600,000 of their employees on the fundamentals of artificial intelligence. And they're going to train uh 
250000 to go way deeper on this uh, so that they can learn how to use AI tools equitably, sustainably, and without bias. So I think what the audience ought to think about um, is why would this company make this big of a bet on a particular kind of uh, technology capability unless it really felt that this was use every cliche you got game changing it's transformative whatever but i would also tell you that this kind of signals that the traditional software market that we know is probably in a world of trouble that they don't even realize yet so if you want to talk about a sub rosa kind of story i think this is the it because um and I have a little familiarity with Accenture, but, uh, you know, because of my past with them, they don't make bets like this, um, you know, just willy nilly. And if they make one, they're probably going to stick with it, too, in a big way. But they have this go to market capability by vertical that is incredible. And they've got decades of experience with that. And if they want to, they can apply uh, everything from generative AI, machine learning, robotic process automation, you name it, they'll, they'll probably apply that to all kinds of different industry vertical templates, and they will do undoubtedly an incredible job of this stuff. And I think it's going to, if I were, if I were a application software vendor, and I have like 3,500 developers, and that would be in a big software company, I would be worried about this because if they turn their guns and focus on automating um, in entire industries, if you will, what does that leave for the other old school vendors who are still trying to figure out how to create a job description using generative AI? Indeed, <clears throat> though I also would point out, I mean, you know, I've I've made a lot of fun of Accenture because just just a year and a half ago they issued this decade vision that was centered around I think already discredited concepts around so-called web me in the metaverse and stuff like that that I felt like were mostly created by venture capitalists for their own fantasies around the future of the internet. Obviously, AI is a whole different can of worms, but I do want to point out that that firms like Accenture and the infrastructure providers. They're, they they win at AI whether or not customers achieve, you know, good results or not. And and I do think that customers are going to adopt this technology and eventually figure out how to use it. But one of the really interesting themes that I picked out in some of my articles, uh, which we don't have really a lot of time to go into at the moment, is is customers struggling for viable use cases in the short term. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and some of that has to do with things like compliance and regulatory issues you can't if you're a banking firm you can't have customer facing you know chatbots uh willy-nilly without making sure that they're not going to violate certain disclosure rules and things like that um but like i thought this was interesting um there's an article on bloomberg on cnbc about bloomberg and how they plan to integrate gpt style ai into its terminal now, Bloomberg's interesting because they they essentially built their own AI model, which uses some of the GPT-based technology via OpenAI, similar stuff, but they actually train their own model. So it's like, oh, man, they must have some really cool stuff with all this deep financial information. And I read that, that the financial information giant says that Bloomberg GPT, its internal AI model, can more accurately answer questions like this, who is the CEO of Citigroup? assess whether headlines are bearish or bullish for investors and even write headlines based on short blurbs. Come on, man. I mean, that, those are, that's weak sauce. Those are weak use cases. That's, and, and so Accenture staffing up for much more deeper and more meaningful use cases than that. But I just wanted to point that out that, that companies are still figuring this out. And there's a article in venture beat about this. Goldman Sachs CIO is anxious to see results from generative AI but moving carefully in it, there's some very revealing quotes in there around wanting to make sure that that the results are accurate and all this kind of thing. So I guess what I wanted to point out is what I'm hearing from customers is that there are some so-called low-hanging fruit use cases, like some customers really like the job description one that we've heard from all vendors this fall because they can see the time that they could save with that. But a lot of the most interesting use cases are going to require some co-innovation and some creativity and actually applying these technologies. And so 
That's not happened yet. So I just kind of wanted to point that out. Brian, okay. before we bring Lori on, do you have any final kind of comments on all of that? No, I think, you know, it's not like that old deal. Watch this space. You know, that real estate sign. That's what we're going to see over here. Indeed. And guess what? We actually have our guest on. We got Lori. Do we hey, have a slide? how are you? Hi, Lori. We, do we have a slide for you? Oh, oh, Brian, we have your... <laughs> you can skip past that one. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's our... We can't do that. That next slide is a sneak preview. Hey, Lori, did you get a chance to, um, to see that thing that Brian sent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we go to user conferences, so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, are we are we going to actually try that at the end of your segment? Sure. Oh my uh, God, Lori! Wow, you are you are one you're brave for for going uh, for doing that. But I well, think you guys always bring a smile to my face. So happy well, wa to. welcome to the show, Lori, and thank you for joining us. We saw Lori uh, both of us this fall at various events, and <laughs> and I want to explain to you real quick how how people like Lori wind up on my show. There's two surefire ways to get onto shows of mine. One is if you ask enough pesky questions to vendors. <laughs> Lori? Well, in that case, I'll be here forever. But anyway. Yeah, Brian, I you're, ask a lot you're, of pesky you're, questions. <laughs> and I personally have witnessed Lori this fall pressing the issue on things like AI data privacy and wanted to get some specifics and push back the happy talk. So well done, Lori. And the other thing is getting into arguments with me. That, <laughs> that's another really good one. And recently, Lori and I almost derailed. A, oh, we were a, bad. A, we were bad. We, we almost derailed a vendor call, a different vendor, because Lori and I wanted to argue about Zoom's uh, approach to AI. So we we're having a nice little yeah. argument in the chat. So anyone who's willing to argue with me and then also get in the face of vendors, like that's going to get you onto the show. So welcome, Lori. I actually think I have my <laughs> Zoomtopia mug here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, so. and I also have, which I'm going to start soon, Oh, Brian's book. Where did you get that? Good job. Uh, well, did you get that on eBay? Oh, <laughs> like me, John. <laughs> Hopefully it's not on eBay yet. Amazon. <laughs> Seriously, folks, if you haven't, if you haven't checked out Brian's ESG playbook uh you should absolutely check it out it's it's really an awesome book it's really well done seriously it's good well laurie i'd like how you got the barbie sweater or at least that's the color yeah, it's well, coming it's off the on theme. i monitor. have to get the halloween outfit now i guess so we didn't get to talk about our most hated buzzwords of the month let's do that real quick mm -hmm. before we get serious with laurie about the fall event season so um brian what's your what, what buzzwords getting under your craw this month well, through the month, I was writing a couple of them down here. Uh, one was fig physical, physical, uh, I can't even pronounce it. It's a <laughs> genius married up physical with digital. Anyway, forget that. Oh, it's one. fidgetal? Fidgetal. Or whatever digital. Oh, nice. Uh, I, I don't like that. I don't like that one. Uh, someone else was using mateship, and I have no desire to ever want to use that. Somebody was talking about uh, in the HR deal something called the great regret, and I think they're really overreaching on that. But the one I still like of all is silent sabotage, and um, that's how you know businesses are. Uh, excuse me, that's how boomers are ruining the workplace silent sabotage so that's my wow. worst buzzword for the month hmm. well i'm i'm my buzzwords that i don't like are ones that i'm stuck with i got invited to do a show now i'm i'm not going to throw this show under the bus but i'm invited to talk about future proofing and i said to them <laughs> i was like you you will allow me to totally make fun of the idea of future proofing right i was like you know, we've really done a really poor job, I think, of future proofing ourselves the last few years. When you think about everything that we didn't see coming, I think we should all be pretty humble about future proofing anything at the moment. Um, but anyway, that's just me. Yeah, I, I'd have to second the future proofing. I hate that. I hate that because, uh, you know, it's, but, you know, I mean, I think really what is the big word? It's AI, right? AI is everything, everywhere. <laughs> and then, on another note, I just have to get it out of there. Witch hunt. If I hear witch hunt one more time, I might slip my throat. So, 
yeah, witch hunt used to be a pretty serious business here in New England, Lori. I, I, I don't. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I think too soon might still apply to that, as far as I'm concerned. That's, but that's, the future that's proofing has got to go because we, you right. know, we can go back and read the future proofing thing tips from two years ago, and you know, now they're all, all right. Different. Should we use the bullshit button for that? Absolute bullshit. <laughs> all right. So that that's future proofing for you. So so Lori, tell us about some of some of the highs and lows of event season for you. What what were some of the things you really took away, and what were some things that you thought weren't so special? Oh, well, I mean, I think one of the things that I've been, you know, pretty pleased about is that the events I've been to, a lot of them anyway, um, the vendors have really seemed to be pretty seriously focused on the data privacy and security issues around AI. And, you know, the ones that really stood out to me as, as, as really coming, you know, coming out with a very kind of solid case about what they're doing or Salesforce and Workday. Um, you know, some of them are still kind of, well, you know, we're not going to use your data and you're going to opt in. And, you know, if your data is used and it's, it, you know, they're saying a lot of good things, but the level and depth of, um, I was impressed with the level and, and depth of, of Workday and Salesforce. The other thing I'm really interested in is this concept, and I was I don't know if it was even associated with an event, but IBM's idea of indemnifying um, any any issues around your use of AI with its 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 AI technologies. So I I think that more and more these vendors are realizing, hey, everybody wants to use AI, but everybody is concerned about these potential negative consequences. And they're they're doing a lot more to kind of put a spotlight on how they're going to help you as a customer of their solutions reduce the risks there. Now, I didn't know if you meant it in a serious way, John, or you meant where I had the best meal or the best um, concert or whatever, but yeah, I, <laughs> I probably, opted for the serious part. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't really want to share um, Las Vegas meal tips. Although, if anyone wants that, I would recommend talking to Brian because he's been there for basically seven weeks, so he he knows the strip as well as anyone. But um, Brian, oh, what what do you think? What, what's your what's your question for Lori? So, Brian? so the thing that really got under my skin uh, the last. Uh, seven, eight weeks was that every vendor uh, wanted to talk about generative AI and they had very few uh, actual in production or even close to being in production kind of real use cases uh, or certainly any kind of a use case that uh, required any real imagination. So vendor after vendor after vendor, and granted, I see a lot of HR vendors, but every one of them wanted to tell me all about the incredible transformative power of being able to generate your own job description. And I'm like, who cares? You could do that with chat GPT. You don't need a commercial app to do that. Just feed it a little bit of something similar and then let it go ahead and write one. Uh, the only vendor that really blew me away on this stuff would have been Ceridian, uh, now called Dayforce. And I had not been at a show like this in ages where I took in four and a half hours, I took 160 photographs of just all of the different kinds of announcements and probably three quarters of them were generative AI kind of based and their stuff was all like either available now or coming out before like March of 2024. So um, kudos to Ceridian for making their show interesting and shame on the rest of them for just using the same two or three overused examples like the job description generator as an example of how they're going to harness the transformative power of generative AI and what it can do. <laughs> Talk about buzzwords. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've heard that to death. I've absolutely heard that to death. Okay. Um, but but Brian, just real quick, on, on the flip side of that, there's also the the more concerning thing, which is the overreach of use cases. So for example, like I also don't really like it when HR vendors are like, we'll show you your top five candidates with generative AI. So you don't have to do the hard work of actually deciding, you know, from a diverse applicant pool, who's the most qualified. There's all kinds of serious legal problems with that kind of overreach as far as I can tell. 
So they film a TV show in Vegas called Battle Bots. It's where geeks beat each other's uh, robots up, you know. And that was me in the press room with the CEO of this one HR vendor who, to your point, John, would not, I'm, I kept asking him, but how does a customer know what your black box is doing to recommend these, uh, you know, people further along in a job you know interview process well they don't have to know yeah they do if they get sued or something they're going to have to be able to explain this no 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 that you know it's not you know and i go well, how do they know your you know bias hasn't gotten into the system oh we'll take care of that you know i mean it was just a bunch of this um deflection but there was never any intent to actually help a customer understand how these utilities and algorithms are actually working and what they can do about it and it gets really interesting when you go down to the smb market because i asked a bunch of customers this week um at the show i was at do you have a data scientist on staff until <laughs> no <laughs> now, do you have uh, how many people do you have in IT? And usually it's one, maybe two. And so, you know, you got. I, and I gave this example to the, the top exec of this company. How I know someone personally, college educated person, who puts his Tesla on autopilot and lets it drive him from Chicago to Indianapolis while he sleeps. Now, he's totaled it three times, okay? And my point is, you don't put tools like some of these powerful, you know, ML and AI kind of tools in the hands of idiots. So, are there some customers you will not sell these advanced technologies to? And all I get is crickets chirping in the background. So, well, you know, it's but from the customer standpoint, we, we did a survey recently with SMBs on AI. So they're all definitely seeing more benefits and drawbacks to it, first of all, though they do see the risks that we've, you know, all been discussing. Um, on the flip side, <clears throat> we asked them, you know, you know, are some of the applications you're using today using AI to your knowledge? And a majority said yes. And then we asked them, do you know how it's using AI? <laughs> and a majority said no, to your point, Brian. So basically, they, even in bigger companies, I mean, having the data scientist expertise on everything is going to be, I would think, pretty much impossible. Um, but that's why it's important for the, the vendors to be crystal clear about how they're creating algorithms and, you know, where content is sourced, getting back to that indemnification thing, because if you are violating copyrights, which I think is going to become a bigger issue um, with the information you're pulling up, <laughs> you know, if you're going into chat GPT on your own, that's one thing, right? But if you're using, you're using that to create content within an enterprise application and you're using copyright and um, content, that's another thing. So, you know, we are at the early days of this generative AI, at least, um, you know, not, not the other types of AI so much, but with the generative AI. And I, I think it's going to, I think there, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to learn through mistakes, <laughs> sadly. Well, I, I had this conversation with somebody about their, um, planning, forecasting, budgeting module, and how it's using artificial intelligence and all this big data. And they're using it to create these incredible, uh, interesting forecasts that are supposedly optimized to the you know, nth degree. I go, so what happens when one of your, and I'll use this, an SMB customer relies on that and the, for whatever reason, the forecast does not materialize. Maybe the maybe the AI tool had an hallucination and forecasted something that will never ever see, you know, that kind of uh, rosy forecast. I go, someone's going to get upset and they're going to want to sue somebody. And guess who's got the deepest pockets of all? It's you, Mr. Vendor. And that's who they're going to come back and sue because you didn't put, you can say you have guardrails, but if you don't have an educated user, you're just, you're just asking for a lawsuit. That's, Anyway. And that's why in the app, like when it's using it, it really has to, I think, surface up to you what the assumptions are, you know, in, in layman's terms. But what went into 
what went into creating whatever it's giving you as an output, right? And then you should be able to, you know, make a better educated guess about whether you want to use it or not. Um, but it's, it is a runaway train <laughs> and everybody seems to want to get on it. So I don't think it's going to slow down, you know, because of these concerns. We have a lively chat going on your chat folks. Thanks. We will revisit some of these comments shortly. Thomas Webernate invited me onto his CRM convos show where I debated a PhD data scientist about generative AI, which was really fun for me. And, and it, in that, I went through... Tell, tell me you wore a lab coat when you did that. I okay. did. I did. Yeah. I wore a lab coat. Anyway, I uh, I went through what I considered the solvable and less solvable problems around AI, and I put explainability right in the middle. Um, my uh, debater, Michael Wu, the, it thinks yeah. explain, he thinks explainability is more solvable than I do, I, but I do think there's progress that can be made. But anyway, it's one of those things where trust in these systems is going to be a serious issue. And I think explainability is more of a design problem in the sense that I think we have to design for it and be careful not to use AI in situations where you have to explain stuff because that's not what these systems, the generative AI systems are not good at that. They, they, that's not how they're built. They're not built to tell you how they arrived at a certain conclusion. So we've got to keep that in mind. Lori, when you go to, when you go to events, what, what is your, what do you think about as far as your goals? Like I'm there cause I'm, I'm chasing down stories and I have agendas around that. What, what is your goal when you go to an event? Not have my flights delayed. I don't know. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, not not no, have terrible seriously. terrible meals. But, you know, yeah. I mean, a lot of my my goals. Obviously, you want to get what what is the vendor's latest narrative, right? Um, and but for me, a lot of times that means, especially if it's a vendor that plays across small, medium, and large business, um, how are they really? What are they doing really to help? small and medium businesses and what's your strategy there and because a lot a lot of vendors is you know we all know they are trying to play in all these markets but the when they do have a really strong enterprise um, business it's hard for them a lot of times to to devote enough time and energy to really serve the small business as well medium you know maybe a little better. So I really try to understand what are they doing with those customers? How are they helping them? Um, what are they doing differently from a product perspective or go to market perspective, um, service perspective, all those kinds of things. Um, and that's a huge, that's, that's a huge issue for AI, right? Because as we discussed, yeah. small, small businesses don't have the resources. Yeah, it, it's an issue totally everything dependent. in technology. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. in technology with SMBs, they, they don't have the resources. Number one, technical resources. But number two, they usually don't have a lot of business process expertise either. Um, you know, like you just said, oh, if they have one IT people, well, if they have one HR person, you know, it's more likely that they're probably using a PEO or something <laughs> um, to take care of their HR needs and having an in-house person if they're small. So it's it's really a question of, um, you know, how are, how are you doing this so it's relevant for these other businesses other than your Fortune 500, you know, stronghold? And um, then, of course, with the businesses or the vendors that focus on small business, it's a different thing. It's really understanding how they're, you know, what they're doing to compete more effectively in that market. But they've already decided that's all we do, you know, if you're zero or to it or somebody like that. So uh, to our audience, we have something very different coming up in just a minute <laughs> that is not GPT created, but Brian's from Brian Summers brain. Uh, and Lori has agreed to partake in this with us. Uh, <laughs> Lori, do you actually have the script up as well? I do. I have okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're going to get to something very, very different in just a moment. <laughs> but uh, before we do that, Rebecca, if you're watching and still here, post a comment in the chat. Maybe we'll bring you on at the very end. Uh, before we get there, I just want to run through. There's been a bunch of really interesting comments. Um, and maybe you all will want to respond to one or two of them. Um, 
so just one sec, let me just go back up. Uh, Thomas points out the security and privacy are more solvable problems. This gets back to that whole hour long show. Just check my LinkedIn post if you want to see how we got into those problems. Greg says he's skeptical that most people understand the AI risks. The greatest noise seems around copyright, but he thinks the biggest security privacy issues are the LLM content and how it's handled. Um, and Maureen, hi, Maureen. You're up late. Thank you for joining. Tracy Webster, and this is where ChatGPT can be terrible because it's pulling antiquated data in words. There are some enterprise innovations around that, and everyone's talking about RAG to as one means of updating ChatGPT, but to your point, it's been trained on older data sets. Greg posted a job description for himself, I think. Uh, Greg, you're going to have to explain that a little bit more. Uh, that's your chat GPT job description that you made from your comment, I think. So Greg, Greg really likes the low hanging fruit of the job description. So uh, from those comments, did anything jump out that you all want to discuss real quick? Oh, somebody appreciates the hallucination part. Okay. That's yeah. good. I mean, I, I think in our survey that the S and B's they, they, that answered it said they were most concerned about data privacy and security. I don't even think that, you know, a lot of them were even thinking of the copyright issues at that point. I think we fielded the survey in July. But one of their biggest fears was unintended negative consequences. And I think that just still points to how new all this is. Like, we don't know what can go haywire. I mean, we do know some of the things that can go haywire with this. But we don't know all of the things, and we certainly don't know all the ways it could negatively impact our business, right? So, um, you know, I, I think it's like the fear of the unknown is is kind of out there to a certain degree. Indeed. And Rebecca points out that, uh, that more vendors are going to offer to take on liability for clients using Gen AI just like Microsoft and IBM have. And I'll also point out that there's a very interesting uh, pending discussion. This spring's going to be a lot more interesting than this fall, I think, as far as these topics. But there's a lot playing out around pricing with vendors rolling out really different pricing Ooh, schemes. Um, everything from consumption-based pricing, which uh, firms like Box have been looking into, uh, to all, all kinds of different pricing models. So that's going to be an interesting story to watch also. Oh, yeah, that that so. is going to be huge because it's all over the map right now. And this is something, again, really important for SMBs. Most SMBs are not going to be able to pay a big surcharge on top of the application they already use, like $30 per user per month. So, I mean, we'll have to see how all these models play out. But, um, you know, though. That is what a number of vendors have already introduced, right? And yep. um, I worry that, you know, if we don't go to more of a consumption thing or, you know, some of them are giving it away right now, but I don't know how feasible that is over the long term because it's expensive. But we're going to be in a situation where these huge companies can really, you know, take advantage of AI up to, you know, in, in, you know, make all the differences, right, with AI. Whereas these smaller companies, the cost is going to be prohibitive for them. So it, it will be interesting to see how all this works out. I must say vendors like Intuit and Xero that cater to small businesses, it's so far, it's bundled in to, you know, the price of the application. Well, I think you're going to have some... AI deserts that form because there are some companies like take a manufacturer that's got tons of like IOT devices and other stuff. Yeah, if they want to use some powerful production scheduling or forecasting technology, the consumption of data that they're going to go through, it's going to cost, you know, there's a cost vendors are going to want to pass along because of that, maybe such that some firms aren't going to want to pay for it. Uh, on the mm -hmm. other hand, there are some other companies that have very light data requirements and AI could be, you would think could be a little bit more affordable. But I, I think we're all missing some aspects of the economics here. 
if these same tools can not only generate a job description, they also are doing a great job of generating code. And so I wonder, why is a vendor charging a 30% upcharge premium for something that they, that no human being actually wrote, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, that takes some serious guts to try and pull that off. Uh, I get it if they want to get reimbursed for what they're having to do with their data centers, but you know, if they didn't even write it, what, you know, how can you charge that? In fact, why is a job description generator add-on to a recruiting module cost anything over the regular recruiting application? Exactly. When it has like no real logic other than it just, you know, it's like running grammarly on a memo that you're writing. I mean, you know, it's, you know, Charging. Hey, I like Grammarly. Grammarly's good. <laughs> Just real quick, we can't do justice to this conversation right now, but vendors yeah. who charge for that kind of stuff are going to get made fools of in the marketplace, so you've been put on notice. Uh, Mar Marine says she's glad to hear customers are aware of unintended negative consequences. Tech bros don't seem worried about that at all. I, th I definitely think there's a huge distinction between tech bro AI culture and enterprise AI culture. The customers I've talked with, to Marine's point, are very concerned about the implications of what's going on with all of this. And they are interested in the technology, but they're also proceeding very carefully. And I found that refreshing to hear uh, because I was expecting maybe a little more unbridled enthusiasm, but I'm not really seeing that. I'm seeing curiosity and interest and pretty intense, but definitely a desire to check all the boxes. And to be honest, I don't think vendors accomplish that this fall. And let's stop talking about eliminating bias and eliminating hallucinations. That's just bullshit conversations that doesn't help us. Um, but anyhow, um, I know you guys probably want to respond to that, but we have something completely different. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Rebecca, for chiming in. Rebecca, I'm going to send you a link to the show back in in a few minutes. But first, we have to get through something really interesting that Brian created. It's Brian, do you want to explain what the hell this is real quick to our audience? So I thought it'd be kind of fun if we took a moment and did a little quick role play. It'll be... Um uh, the role play will be Laura and I are the proud parents of our love child, John Reed, who's going to use artificial <laughs> intelligence, uh, if you will, at home. And uh, it's titled, If Tech Marketers Spoke, Conference Speak at Home. So we okay. just want to give you an idea of just how bad this language is. Uh, and I know for me, I'm just... My head is just swimming in this garbage right now. Now, um, keep in mind, we have never rehearsed this before. So this is Correct. this is a debut. So, okay, Lori, take it from All the right. top. Well, as Brian said, we go to user conferences, so you don't have to. And as a result, one of the things you don't have to hear is the smarmy marketing drack, <clears throat> Brian, that comes standard in so many and too frequent keynotes. There's been a lot of irksome marketing speak uttered in this fall's user conferences, so much so that we wondered if the same technology marketers spoke this way in their own homes, what would happen? And here's how that would sound. Lori says, here we are. One, <laughs> I'm getting your notes a little mixed up. We have one school day afternoon. We're setting the scene here. Dad, Dad, can you help me with my English essay? Well, certainly, son, but you don't need my help. Now, with the power of generative AI, the words will simply write themselves. You really think so, Dad? 100%. But how can that be? The miracle of generative AI is in the in-depth training our patented LLMs, large language models, have gotten. They've parsed countless literary works like C. Spot, C. Jane, in their <laughs> efforts to create the essay generating wonder that will revolutionize homework for generations and generations of students. Uh, gee, thanks, Dad. <laughs> now, 20 minutes later, John's been hard at work. Boy, Dad, I fed all of your old love letters. That's awkward. Tax returns <laughs> and family history into the LLM's public database. The results seem to get a lot creepier, but definitely more entertaining. By the way, do you know why my email inbox is blowing up with scams and viruses? Oh, 15 minutes later. Sorry, I missed my script moment there. Hi, Lenny. I'm home. Where's Junior? 
Oh, you'd be so proud of him. He's upstairs harnessing the power of generative AI to write his English essay. I thought he was working on a psychology paper, not English. Oh, Oh, you're right. He is doing a paper on fantasies, but given the awesome power of generative AI to hallucinate, he should get an A plus on that essay. His paper is on Timothy Leary. He'll certainly get an A plus. Gotcha. Uh, I think we might need to skip towards the end, folks. Brian, <laughs> can we like move down a little bit? All right, here? I'll tell you what. Um, let's just go to now. Nah, let's just kill it. Um, Anyway, the point is, folks, this, <laughs> this these shows were an exercise in trek all the way around. Uh, it was hyperbolic to an extreme. And uh, I know I did 30 vendor interviews alone last week at the HR Tech show. And if they weren't telling me about their platform, they were telling me about the power, the transformative power of generative AI. I don't know what Lori and John noticed, but man, that's all I heard. Well, that is a buzzword phrase, yes. So, Brian, you've sought, you've achieved your revenge by challenging vendor marketers to see if they can talk this way at home and get away with it. I'm guessing that they can't. Oh, I think is it any different, time. though? They're always talking about the transformative power of whatever it is that the latest thing is. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure, you know. Actually, it makes it worse because they're always future-proofing and transforming with whatever new thing they have to future-proof and transform with. Well, as long as there are PR handlers telling them to stay on message, we're going to be hearing about the generative, you know, transformational powers of AI. Anyway. To future-proof your business. Mm -hmm. Well, John, where do we want to go next? Uh, well, we are basically towards the end, but I'm going to um, I'm going to send Rebecca an invite in case she wants to come on for a couple minutes. Um, Brian, do you have your worst PR pitch of the month handy? Yeah, I got a uh, deal from HP Communications this week, and it was titled "It's Time to Make the Switch from On Premises to Cloud." So. <laughs> I just want you to know it's 2023 and it's official. We've gotten that from HP Communications. I personally will be thinking about making the move to multi-tenancy around 2037. That's my goal. <laughs> yeah, I think this show's at the risk of becoming legacy if we're not careful. <laughs> so my PR, worst PR pitch of the month is kind of like borderline. It could end up being okay. But, um, but I got... I got a pitch that was, oh, by the way, Rebecca, the link is in your um, LinkedIn messages. So pop that in. I got a pitch that basically assured me that this AI startup had solved the uh, hallucination problem. So I said, fine, let me talk to one of your customers. And there was a silence for like a week. And then they came back and said, okay. So I was like, I want to validate this with your customers. They're like, well, we need to join the interview. And I was like, no. I was like, I got to talk to your customer alone about this and ask them like if it's like actually accurate or not. And they said, yes. So this is an ongoing drama. So basically I'm going to interview a customer and find out for myself if I'm very, very skeptical that, uh, that they've been able to eliminate all hallucinations from their generative AI. But I'm about to find out. So I don't know if that's a bad PR pitch or not. I guess it could be an interesting one. It's been a lot of, a lot of drama back and forth around like and, and you know ordinarily i would let someone accompany their customer to an interviewer discussion but in this case i just feel like i need to have the customer one-on-one -on -one to really talk about that experience and really get the real deal so anyway that's my inbox drama for y'all well, hi rebecca happy friday everybody yeah so you were uh sitting in on our discussion did you have any thoughts on that um you know the one thing i didn't hear you say that that uh, I seem to hear a lot this season was technical debt. So brought to you by the vendor that brought you the technical debt will now be helping you eliminate your technical debt. Thank you very much. Nice. And and how does one eliminate technical debt? This fault, does AI solve that? You streamline vendor management. Ah, excellent. 
Any uh, anything? What else did you see this this fall, Rebecca? I know you, know, you were at a bunch you of. You know shows. what I what I did like seeing was more of a focus on how are we actually going to help people understand the value of the software they're getting. You know, if you look at what ServiceNow is doing with Impact, you look at what uh, Salesforce has started to work on with the customer um, success score. Let's really use cloud in the way it was intended so we can actually understand how our customers are using the software, where are they getting value, not based on a QBR, but on actually what's happening in the software. So people can start to say, what are what are users actually using that delivers value? And what could we probably turn off or start, stop licensing, right? Because the whole idea is cloud is I should be paying based on what I'm actually using and how I'm actually getting value. Yeah, I really like that. One of my sort of things I'm researching further right now that I'm actually excited about is 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 seeing customers take more responsibility for their own metrics on how they're going to evaluate the success of projects. And I had some interesting conversations about that with some customers this fall. And I really find that kind of thing refreshing because, Rebecca, it plays to your point around data, like the ability to gather meaningful data from SaaS solutions is really helpful, but a lot of times the vendor is the one that defines what constitutes success with that data. And I really want to see customers kind of owning that conversation and saying, how do we define the success of these projects? Because I don't care what technology it is. And until you do that, you won't really know. And just throwing AI at those problems isn't going to solve that either. And so I love this concept of, of customers starting to define for themselves what success means and had some really interesting conversations about that, including like, like, what does it mean to your employees? Like, how did what do they consider a successful uh, software, you know, implementation? Um, you know, because, you know, for them, it's like, well, did it make my job easier? Did it, you know, did it help me to, you know, did, did I reduce administrivia and actually make a difference? Am I afraid that I'm going to get a headcount reduction experience as a result of this? So I also talked with two customers. I asked them, are you afraid of automation and AI? And they were like, no. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, we don't do layoffs in our company. So our employees aren't, aren't afraid. And I was what? like, I was like, that's pretty cool. And this one company hadn't done a reduction in force since the company was started 27 years ago. And I was like, hey, how about that? Like, that really reduces fear and anxiety when you know that no one in the history of this company has ever been laid off. Mm -hmm. But there could be a first. Right. But the point is, there's, <laughs> the point is there's a lot more trust, right, than there would be yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you're working for, like, actually some of the software vendors that sell AI that actually do reduction yeah. in forces all the time. So anyway. Yeah, but I mean, back to, back to your point, John, about customers kind of identifying their own success and their own metrics. People using the software, the idea that adoption is a proxy for value is ridiculous, right? And I think we'll, what we'll see with some of the stuff around Gen AI is, can I eliminate the need for users to use certain pieces of software entirely? And is that how I get more value? But the idea that adopting more features by its nature delivers more value from the software, I think is, is a dangerous idea. But Rebecca, we can measure adoption, so it must be a good metric. <laughs> If the audience has any question for our Steam panelists, please start posting those in the chat because they'll probably wrap in five or ten. So please uh, pepper these individuals with any remaining questions you have about the amazing fall event tour that we've been on. Although there is probably a little bit more to go. I, I don't know about y'all. I got a couple more events up my sleeve. You probably do too. A few more. A few more. Well, I'll be in San Antonio next week, but that's a personal trip. For So for a change, I'm going to actually not wear a tie or a jacket on a plane. I'm going down there for completely unrelated software reasons. But speaking of software, uh, one thing we could talk about is I'm seeing a coalescence happening now with APM, e, uh, uh, ESG, and ERM, Enterprise Risk Management, Enterprise Performance Management, ESG, all kind of coming together under a single platform. I've already run into two vendors that are trying to make that happen, and they haven't uh, formally announced anything, but you could see you could see the stuff starting to click together on that now. Um, anyway, it, are we getting any kind of bites there, John? Anybody firing? Well, Greg wanted to know what the best mass-produced lunch chicken is, but that's a little out of 
out of school. Uh, <laughs> but, well, I will tell uh, I was thrilled this week uh, uh, to be in a press room where they didn't have the usual flat meat platter out there. Um, they actually had some warm, real food that didn't come in a box. So uh, I can't comment on the chicken deal, but um, yeah, the mystery meat is always something you got to steer clear of at those things. <laughs> Brian, just real quick on the whole EPM ESG thing. Why would customers care about that exactly? Well, because as it turns out, some of the risk management things are just, you know, really exploding and bubbling up. There are new reporting requirements. Uh, the SEC is about to drop. And uh, same thing with on the ESG side. Uh, they all have a similar kind of architecture on how they suck data out of the operational and financial systems and HR systems. They move it to a like a data lake. They do calcs and other things to it. Then they map it to different kinds of regulatory reports and dashboards. That same architecture that you find in EPM, you're going to find it in those other things as well. So, um, uh Smart vendors already figured that out, and they're just trying to get ahead of the curve. So that's it. Got it. Yeah, when we picked our most hated buzzword, I was thinking about doing something along the data mesh, data lake house thing. Oh. Like, yeah. if, if if we redefine these repositories one more time, I'm going to need a suppository. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, Is that a what? cross between what uh, was? I think too much information. Too much information. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so the the data summer cottage doesn't work for you, John? No, the data. Yeah, the data. The data outhouse. Um, <laughs> All right, this is really uh, Thomas Weber, uh, and they could actually reduce costs, especially oh. on the sustainability side. So Thomas actually has a serious question for you, Brian. So we. Should, Take that serious. Uh, what was, uh, can you flash it up? It kind of uh, he he uh, wonders if that would actually reduce cost on the sustainability side. Well, you know, we can always hope for that. But my my observation, software vendors is prices only go one direction with most vendors mm -hmm. to the moon, and uh, and they never come back down. So I don't know if we're going to see that. If they should, by the way, I did run into some HR vendors that are uh, doing like Zoho does. They're selling any and all of their products for $9 per user per month now. And I thought that's the way to do it, man. Let's, let's take the friction out of the process and the need to have expensive negotiators and lawyers and all that kind of stuff. That was a good move. Yeah. I, I have a feeling a lot of these publicly traded vendors won't, <laughs> won't be doing that soon. <laughs> That's only because they haven't fully realized the transformative powers of generative AI. AI. That's right. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> Apparently you didn't see that coming. Uh, that was a blind spot in your database that you trained your software LLM on. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it is true though. I mean, I, when somebody mentioned it before, the I think you, Brian, the development costs are going down, right? But the software prices keep going up for a lot of vendors. Well, we haven't gone totally into the cloud yet. You know, we just got the email this week from, you know, from HP sure. on that. Okay. Well, I know Lori has social engagements this, this Friday evening. So, Lori, I want to I want to I want to get us into a wrap here. Uh, but thanks a lot for for coming on. It was a pleasure to have you. And and Rebecca will have you on again when we can discuss in more detail. But but I would like to ask each of you in closing. What what kind of thing are you are you working on in terms of your research? What's what's an element where you where you have unanswered questions that you're going to keep pursuing? Lori, let's start with you so you can go off to your eating plan. Sure. Well, you know, we do a lot of research with the SMBs to understand what's going on with them. We just finished up a big study on on AI. Um, and we have we have free ebooks out there if anybody wants to see some of the top line results. But um, the next one we're doing is what we call our SMB priorities survey, and this will be for 2024. So in this, we we take a, we really look at both your business priorities, like what are the top drivers and priorities for your business, and then what and where and how they're investing in technology to support those priorities. Um, so it'll be interesting to see you know, what's kind of changed from last year to this year, especially because 
the AI thing kind of exploded. Mm. Um, and, you know, will they be investing more, for instance, in technology because of AI, because they feel like that this is just something they're going to need to do to stay competitive. But we're, we're going to look at a whole bunch of different angles on that. But it's always a good kind of comprehensive look on uh, at where they are and what they're thinking about and what they're planning to do and what's holding them back. <laughs> Cool. Well, Lori, thanks for staying so long. You can leave any time. You can stay okay. to the end if you want, but you're good. All right. Thanks. And, Great talking to you guys. Yeah, and thanks for bringing your domestic companion in the shoot oh, as well. Oh, she's still there, Layla. Yeah, she's, she's adorable. Yeah, she yeah. is. She's a good girl. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye. See you, Lori. Rebecca, what about you? Yeah, so surprise, surprise. We're looking at the transformative nature of generative AI. But seriously, looking at a couple of things around AI, like talking to HR leaders about how are they thinking about how I retrain workers. And this is not about replacing workers or reskilling workers, but how do I give pe people a reinitiation of those critical thinking skills that are going to be really important as I think about do I take that AI recommendation or not, particularly if I'm, if I'm incented to do so in some way. And also looking about the language around AI, right? The way I talk about it, the way I train people on it, the way I communicate about it matters. And looking at how do I use the right language and help pe people understand both what the value is and how they can effectively use it. Well, that should keep you busy for a while. Keep me out of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you actually figure out how we should actually be speaking about AI, I think we could all benefit from a crash course in that. So that I'll look forward to that research greatly because i think how we talk about these things really matters had some interesting discussions with vendors for example on the uses of the words like smart and intelligent and marketing and what that actually means but that's just the tip of the iceberg i think right absolutely brian what about you what are you working on i know you've got a lot going with esg obviously with your with your book but yeah that'll keep going uh but rebecca if you need a title for your ai piece call it uh, you can't spell pain without the letters ai and uh, uh, but what i'm working on let's see i teased this up a little bit on uh, a piece i did this week on the hr tech show uh, i thought it was fascinating when we're looking at a market that now has con you know constrained venture capital you got a bunch of pe firms who haven't been able to do some exits for some of their overvalued companies and they're looking at a you know uh, scarf up some inexpensively priced firms right now uh, what all that's leading up to is that i think a lot of companies need to revisit the channel that they sell through so if it's a direct to buyer channel that may be the most expensive way to sell and produce the slowest growth and i think where if your money's tight capital's tight you really need to look at more partnerships uh more um um I, you know uh, partnerial arrangements like with private equity firms volume deals with them um i could go on and on but there's ways for companies to pick up a lot of logos uh like through a distributor that they i think a lot more companies need to be examining now that they haven't been looking at that for a long time uh when capital was cheap the direct deal was okay but now i think companies fundamentally have to revisit um, how they're going to make their money all right well that should keep us busy till our next month in review show uh, I'm, I'm not going to really repeat mine, but I, I'm really interested in this area of appropriating the customer success conversation on the customer's terms. And so I'll be hopefully writing more on that with what I learned this fall. So Brian, I think we did it, man. Uh, sorry we didn't get through the whole script, but I think we gave That's viewers a, a flavor for, for how to not talk about generative AI at home. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I've seen rebecca so much lately that it's actually nice to see you for a change just in a little like one by two <laughs> kind of grid on my laptop right now um uh, we've been at a ton of different things lately so um anyway uh I, i'm not going to speak for everybody else but i'm actually glad for me most of the show stuff is finally done for this fall so uh, you know um i feel 
liberated, if you will, right now. So, John, I guess I'll say goodbye. And yeah, I think we're good, peeps. Thanks a lot to all of those of you in the chat. Uh, as as noted before, we're still refining the format for this, but once a month we will do this, and and your contributions are definitely important to keep us on track and keep give us a sanity check. So thanks for having a little bit of fun with us. I think the enterprise could use a little more humor at times. So, but we also need to like talk about real issues. So thanks for helping us to do both and we'll catch you next time. Thanks a lot, Brian and Rebecca. Thanks, John. Thanks, sir.